Hi, welcome to Ethics. My name is Mark Dorsby. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, Book 7. This, um, and in this book, Aristotle's going to focus on the problem of incontinence. And hopefully you've been watching the video series because in the previous books of the Ethics, we've seen Aristotle consistently refer to the problem of the incontinent person. And again, the incontinent person refers to the person who, who acts wrongly, but they do so in a way in which they know they shouldn't act the way they're doing, but they still do it anyway. In other words, the incontinent person appears to be someone who's out of control, or that is, cannot control their actions, um, even though they know they should. So this is sort of the problem of incontinence, and you can a good example of this would be to think about the smoker. The person who's smoking and knows that it's bad and harmful to smoke, the question is, why do they keep smoking? And in many ways, this is the problem of incontinence. <clears throat> also, I'll just do a quick aside. Normally, as if you've been watching the videos, I usually have nice, beautiful slides built up. Well, I don't know if they're beautiful, but more pro uh, professional presentation. I haven't had time to do that today, and so, but I wanted to get this video out. And so instead, of I, instead, what I've done is I've created, by hand, I've created sort of lecture note outlines. And I'm just going to sort of take you through those and walk you through this book by sort of looking at point by point the key arguments and ideas that Aristotle discusses. The first one to discuss here is um, Aristotle begins in section one by um, articulating that there are three moral states that we should avoid. We should avoid vices, we should avoid the state of incontinence, and we should avoid the state of brutishness. Now, what do all these things mean? Well, vices, you should be familiar with that at this point, right? From Aristotle's view, happiness is an activity of the soul in accordance with virtue. Virtue is excellence. A virtue is always the mean or the intermediate between excess and defect. Doing too much or doing too little. Or not doing the right thing at all. And then going too far in terms of how you're trying to act. So virtue is a middle point. So you have vices, vices are opposed to virtues. Now incontinence, we've talked a little bit about, is opposed to continence. But what about this third state, brutishness? Well, Aristotle's notion of brutishness is this idea of when people act in a sort of animalistic sense, right? People, um, the examples he give for, gives, for instance, of brutishness is actually the first major example he gives is of a person, of a woman who cuts open the, uh, the belly of a pregnant woman and then eats the child inside. Apparently this must have been something that was done in the ancient world. And so he gives this as an example of brutishness. Now, brutishness is obviously a terrible state. and It's opposed to what you might call superhuman excellence, right? And Aristotle actually, he says that the superhuman excellence is obviously really rare. Um, it's something like a divine nature, and he refers to this person as having the characteristics of a, quote, godlike man from 1145 A 28. So you have brutishness as opposed to, I guess, the sort of, divine nature. Now, brutishness for Aristotle is rare, so he doesn't think that most people occupy this state. Um, and he says, where did this state occur? Says, well, we see this state occurring, for instance, when you in foreigners. So you can see there's a sort of cultural, um, I don't know, maybe a sort of soft cultural bigotry that Aristotle has here. Basically, right, those outside of Hellenistic civilized culture, you know, um, seem to be more inclined towards brutishness on Aristotle's view. I mean, you, you can tell he's a product of his age. Um, but brutishness rarity also may result from disease or deformities in various cases. Um, you could have psychological disease even um, and deformity. So he's not, we'll see him talk about brutishness here, but we're going to see really the question, the focus of the discussion is on the incontinence and continence. Now Aristotle does distinguish incontinence and continence from from the softness versus endurance dichotomy, right? You can either be someone, in softness here, he's thinking about physically, right? A person who's physically soft, right? That's a bad state, right? Instead, they should have hardness of flesh, he says, or in other words, they have to have endurance. So, but you can see that he's not talking about softness and endurance here. He really just wants to focus on incontinence. Now, let us let me read you a quote here from book seven. This is, uh, from 1145 B11, and Aristotle says, quote, And the incontinent man, knowing that what he does is bad, does it as a result of passion. While the continent man, knowing that his appetites are bad, 
does not follow them because of his reason. So what it looks like here is that the continent person, the incontinent person, knows that something's bad, but they still act. So what they're doing is they're acting out of passion, out of their appetites, rather than acting out of reason. And ultimately acting out of reason is what he aligns with the characteristic of continence. So this raises the question though, what's the difference between incontinence and self-indulgence? Because it's clear that the incontinent person acts out of passion because maybe they have these appetites, these desires. But isn't that what the self-indulgent person does? What exactly is the difference? We're going to see that for Aristotle, there is a big difference. Um, and um, it particularly bodes poorly for the self-indulgent person you're going to see. Now, in section two, Aristotle begins with some couple questions here. And really what he's after is trying to articulate what exactly is the relationship between reason and the continent person and the lack of reason or the type of reason that the person who's incontinent has, but how does that relate to action? So for instance, can the incontinent person act with right belief, right? So imagine here we have an incontinent person and they're, all incontinent people have beliefs. Some of those beliefs are right. Some of those beliefs are wrong. Now remember for Aristotle, belief is a completely different category than knowledge. Obviously there's a relationship there, but you can say is that the incontinent person who has who acts out of the right belief, well, that turns out well for them. But the incontinent person who, who acts out of their beliefs and those beliefs are wrong, well, then they act wrongly. So you can see here, well, could what does it mean when the incontinent person acts with right belief, right? How does that puzzle work out? And another sort of similar, similarly related question is the question of whether or not those people who have knowledge can act wrongly. So in other words, can the knowledgeable act wrongly. Now to this, Socrates says no, right? And if you go back to your Plato and you read the Platonic Dialogues, you'll see that Socrates denies that incontinence is possible because for Socrates, as soon as you have the knowledge of what is right, you will act rightly, right? So Socrates' view here is that uh, the incontinent, what we call the incontinent person, really is a person who acts out of ignorance. They lack the proper knowledge. Now, there's a middle view that Aristotle wants to distinguish from this other possibility of Socrates's, which is namely that maybe that the person who acts incontinently is acting out of opinion, not of ignorance, but acting out of opinion, right? Because think about it, for instance, you can imagine that the incontinent person is acting in a manner that's consistent with their pleasure, such that the incontinent person, right, let's say the smoker, who knows it's wrong to smoke, but they have the pleasure of the experience of smoking, and so they've formed an opinion that maybe smoking is good because it causes pleasure, and therefore they choose that. Um, so we're going to see sort of Aristotle try to distinguish this and sort of figure some of these puzzles out. Now, one of the first things he says here is that, well, incontinence, okay, means having the wrong appetites. Those appetites can frequently be strong. Now, by contrast, the person who has temperance, that's the virtue of self-control for Aristotle, the excellence of knowing when you've, you've had enough for yourself, but also knowing when um, knowing what you need, right? Temperance means having the right appetites, right? So the temperate person has the right appetites. The incontinent person appears to have the wrong appetites. But continence to the extreme is also bad. So in the example here that he gives is a person who holds to their opinions under all conditions, right? So especially for a person who has continence and they have the wrong opinions, this will turn out to be bad, right? Now, if you have an incontinent person who has the wrong opinions, but they, because they're incontinent, they ultimately abandon those opinions, then isn't that good? Well, Aristotle thinks that that argument is what he calls a sophistical argument, right? He doesn't think that the incontinent person, by happenstance, who does the good thing because they've abandoned their opinions, um, even though they may have what Aristotle says as an incidentally good moment, right? Ultimately, the incontinent person is living in a worse state than the continent person. Well, why? Well, Aristotle gives this example. He says, well, what about the person who has folly and incontinence? So imagine a person, folly means foolish. So imagine a person who's foolish, but they're also incontinent. So, so that means that they chew, they will have the wrong appetites and they try to attain those wrong appetites. But because they're a fool, they are unable to attain them. And so then by accident, 
they do the right thing. So in other words, does folly or foolishness combined with incontinence yield virtue? Right? And that seems crazy. That seems a highly problematic problem. So you can see here is what we've got to do is ascertain what exactly is incontinence without qualification. That is, what is incontinence in its purest essence? Right? So this leads us to, to section three of the text. <clears throat> Where Aristotle asks, well, do incontinent people act knowingly? And if they do act with knowledge, well, in what sense? So let's sort of start off here. He has a starting point. And he says, let's imagine that you have the incontinent person. I put this as the I man. And you have the continent person. This is the C man, right? Remember, the incontinent person has the wrong appetites. The continent person has the right appetites. But here's the thing, is that both the continent and the incontinent person can have the same object of concern. And so you can see I drew on this little sort of barely, these sort of dotted arrows that are pointing towards the X. And Aristotle's notion here is that, so the question is, is the difference between the continent and the incontinent person a difference between the object that they're concerned with attaining, or is it concerned with their attitudes towards that object? So in other words, is it the X that they're aiming at, or is it the arrow that's pointing towards the X, which is at stake here, right? Well, into the question of whether or not there is a different, what the, whether or not the difference is really between attitude or object, Aristotle raises a couple points. Point A, the incontinent person is only concerned with the self-indulgent object, and they seem to only be concerned with it in a specific way. So it depends what that X is, but if that X is something that provides pleasure, for instance. Well, the self and the incontinent person is concerned with that object, and they're concerned with it in a way in which they can elicit that pleasure, right? So that's the first sort of thing. So in this example, you can say the person, the smoker who sees the cigarette, right? They are concerned with the object, but they're concerned with it because they want to smoke it. Okay, point B. Knowledge has two senses. When we say that's, that the incontinent person knows, right? On the one hand, you can have knowledge which is unused. So in other words, you have people who have knowledge but don't act on that knowledge. And on the other hand, you can have people, you can have knowledge in action, or that that means people who have knowledge and act upon that knowledge. So there's this relationship here between knowing and acting. And you can see here is that you can have knowledge without action and knowledge with action. But number C or letter C. We can also distinguish the difference between universal versus particular propositions. Now this is sort of interesting, and here you have to be a little bit cognizant of Aristotle's classic categorical uh, logic here, right? And in his categorical logic, propositions can either be universal or particular. A universal proposition is any proposition in which you talk about anything in the universe, right? Uh, you say, all water is made of H2O, right? Or you say that, uh, all humans must breathe in order to live, right? Those are universal claims. Now, particular claims is when you just talk about one or a couple things in the world. You say that some, some people like red, smelling red roses. That's a particular proposition. And what he recognized here is that when you talk about universal propositions, action is not actually possible, right? Because if something is universally the case, then there's nothing you can do as a particular being in the world as a particular agent which can affect that universality. So that means that when we talk universal propositions refer to propositions in which action is not possible. Now of, you can have two types of universal propositions. You can have universal propositions with regard to the agent, the incontinent person, or you can have universal propositions with regard to the object, the thing that they're concerned with. Right Now by contrast, particular propositions, because they're particular, they are concerned, or things which can be done in the world are always going to come out as particular propositions. So, what does this mean? It means that the, the, the incontinent person can have, as it were, the universal knowledge, but it doesn't seem that they apply it to the particular. So, in other words, it looks like that the incontinent smoker, for instance, can say, uh, smoking is bad for all people. But what the, it doesn't look like the incontinent person is able to then say is that, well, that means it's also bad for me, right? Um, that is, it looks like the incontinent person might be avoiding the particular propositions and just simply, you know, living in the world of the universal. 
And so this looks like this example of the person who's the knowing smoker might, this, this might fit that case. Well, let's keep going, right? Well, number, or letter D here is this notion that there is a sense of having knowledge, but also not having it. And he gives this example of the drunk agent, the person who acts, but they're drunk while they're acting. In a certain way, this person can have knowledge, but then not have knowledge, right? Um, or we would say that they didn't know it credibly, right? So, so people who are under an influence can act out of reason and have knowledge, but then they don't seem to have the knowledge. But it seems to be because somehow their rationality is impaired, okay? And this will be important when you think about incontinence. Now, E, the language of the incontinent person is, is like an actor who speaks on the stage. So... Aristotle's view here is that, so that means that maybe when the incontinent person says, I know that smoking's bad, smoking kills, and yet they're smoking while they say it, maybe the words they're speaking don't have the, val the same value or meaning that they do for the person who has knowledge and acts, right? Because it looks like they have knowledge but don't act. So maybe what we can say is that they're just like an actor, right? Where the words are completely uncoupled from their ability to act, right? Um, and I sort of give the example of Donald Trump here. Um, partially the reason is because it looks like Donald Trump, there's two things that most observations of Donald Trump since he's become the president seem to include. The number one is, it, is that it appears that Donald Trump does not have self-control, right? And you see this in the way he tweets, right? And you also see it in the fact that Donald Trump's language is one which constantly betrays itself. That is, Donald Trump will say something and then... Two days later, right, he will say the opposite thing, right? And yet he acts as if he's being consistent the entire time, but it doesn't make any sense. Perhaps it's the case that Donald Trump is the incontinent person, where the language he has is that akin to an actor who speaks on the stage, an actor who uses a script. And in other words, isn't that precisely what people complain about politicians doing? So it's sort of, you see an example, and I don't know, for some of you, maybe this is a highly charged political topic. But it seems to me that Donald Trump is the example of the incontinent person, at least when it comes to his language uh, and the way he uses his language in public. Because uh, it seems to be, it seems to betray itself constantly. Okay, let's move on away from that, right? So you can say here is that, okay, that you have right reason and you have appetite. And it looks like that, our, that the appetite of the incontinent person is contrary to right reason, right? So they desire the cigarette, but it's not reasonable. But the opinion, right, doesn't have to be the same thing as right reason. So you can say is that, well, because opinion is not contrary to the wrong appetites. So you can say that the smoker has the desire to smoke the cigarette, and they have the opinion that it's a good thing to smoke the cigarette, right? Um, he, says, he says, for instance, though, to give you another sort of interesting moment, he says, Animals are not incontinent because they have no relation to universal knowledge or right reason. So in a certain sense, incontinence requires the notion that there be reason. So what is Socrates, what is Aristotle's conclusion? He says, well, Socrates was right, or Socrates must be right in some way, right, to some degree. And ultimately, I think that what you can say is that what Aristotle's view is, is that incontinence is somehow the consequence of having incomplete knowledge. Not a, right having opinions perhaps rather than having a relationship to right knowledge or to right reason. But it, it's interesting because Aristotle begins and it looks like he's actually going to argue against Socrates, but he ends up by really sort of concluding with Socrates. Okay, let's take a look at section four. And here Aristotle he wants to begin digging in and get to. Uh, the distinction between qualified incontinence versus unqualified incontinence. And what we mean by qualified is to give a qualification or a, quali a, a condition in which you would think of incontinence. So, for instance, the person who is unqualifiedly uh, incontinent is purely incontinent, whereas most of us probably just have forms of qualified incontinence, where there are some things we're incontinent about, but mostly we are not incontinent. Right. It does look like point one here is that incontinence is related to pleasure. Right. Now, here, there's a distinction. There's a distinction between necessary pleasures versus pleasures that are worthy of our choice. 
right? So for instance, eating, the pleasure that you get from eating food and the pleasure you get from sexual intercourse, these appear to be necessary pleasures. And they also appear to be pleasures that are worthy of our choice, um, at least in certain parts of our life, right? So um, not always are they worthy of choice, but under certain conditions. Now the problem with sex and eating these other things isn't so much that they're, they're bad pleasures, but it looks like is that we take them in excess, and that appears to be the problem. Now, similarly, or similarly, what we can do is we can say that pleasure can also be, you can also have unnecessary pleasures that are worthy of choice, right? So, for instance, having wealth, having victory, having a beautiful garden, these are pleasures which are not necessary, but they are worthy of choosing, right? So, they're not bad pleasures, as it were. So, it looks like that incontinence resides at this level in terms of its qualification, right? In terms of the in terms of those pleasures which are worthy of our choice but unnecessary. It looks like this is where the incontinent person comes into play, right? Now let's distinguish the incontinent person here from the self-indulgent agent. What about the person who just wants to just indulge with themselves? Socrates wants to distinguish self-indulgence from incontinence, right? For him, the person who's self-indulgent um, can uh, tends to avoid pain but with little appetite, they tend to pursue things into excess, right? So they may even not want something much, but they just keep going and going and going, right? Um, and it looks like the self-indulgent person is really sort of occupied with avoiding pain, really, and then just always reaching into the excessive state. So, so this is Aristotle starting to distinguish here the relationship between incontinence regarding pleasure and the self-indulgent agent and their relationship to pleasure. Now, there are two types of appetites and pleasures which appear to be possible, right? You can have the good and the noble sorts of pleasures. These are, uh, in the good and the noble, it seems to be where most of these incontinent acts concern themselves because it looks like the incontinent person does want to do what's good, um, but they just take things to excess and go the wrong way. Now, opposed to the good and the noble are the contrary and the intermediary states. Oops, let me keep going here. Okay. Now, this brings us to the question of the objects of desire. Now, there are two types of objects. There are objects which are pleasant by nature. And the, and some objects are pleasant because they're naturally pleasant. And there's other things which are pleasant, but they're particular to particular conditions or categories and classes. And on the other hand, you have things which are not pleasant by nature. And these things, the things which are not pleasant by nature, people appear to pers pursue these as objects of desire either because of some sort of deformity, um, either in their person or in their body, or maybe a social deformity, or people pursue things that are not pleasant by nature because of habit, or maybe because they themselves have some sort of bad nature. They themselves do not recognize that they're not pleasant. So it looks like most people pursue the ones which are pleasant, but people do pursue things which aren't pleasant in themselves. And this brings us to the brutish state, which is animalistic, because the brutish state is certainly in this category number two, the things which are not pleasant by nature. And so he gives this example of cannibalism. Um, another example he gives is what about the, the person who pulls their hair out of habit. My daughter used to do this when she was very young. Um, and she would just constantly be twisting and pulling her hair until she started losing her hair. And it became, it's what we call a bad habit. And it's sort of brutish because in the sense that it doesn't seem like a, a, an infant or a, a kid would naturally want to rip their hair out because that hurts, right? That doesn't appear to be something that's not pleasant by nature, okay? So brutishness, though, he says, seems to be beyond the limit of a bias. So if you will, right, there's that godlike state we talked about. There's the state of virtue. There's the state of vice. But brutishness appears to be a quality unto its own, right? It is a sort of worse condition, really. Okay? Now, where nature is the cause, we don't actually... Going back to incontinence, one of the things Aristotle says is, when nature is the cause of the incontinence, we don't usually say a person is incontinent, right? That is, when it has, the incontinence has something to do with the person themselves. So an example of this would be, there's, there are certain conditions, psychological conditions, where people who have suffered brain injuries lose their ability to control their actions. Um, and th this person who has these, a person who had this sort of brain injury would appear incontinent 
but we wouldn't actually call them incontinent once we knew that it was because of a brain injury, right? So when nature is the reason here, we don't actually hold the person as being incontinent. We might say that there's some sort of defect potentially, right? What we can say here is that incontinence, incontinence, uh, we can restrict the category by saying that they concern the objects of indulgence, right? So what we can say is that the person, for the brutish person, incontinence is really just a metaphor. Um, because the brutish person desires things which aren't even pleasant in themselves, right? And so to say it called them incontinent is a bit of a stretch here. And that might be the way in which we can say that the bruised person is really set off in a way that's much further away from vice than incontinence might be. Um, now, let's get to number six. Now, remember, though, vice and incontinence aren't the same thing either, or not the same thing. So next, Aristotle then devotes some discussion on anger. Okay. And anger is interesting because he says first that anger seems to listen to reason to some extent, but to somehow mishear it, right? That is, it looks like the person who's angry is guided by reason to some extent. Imagine, for instance, about the person when you give them a reason that makes them upset, they fly into a rage. But if you gave them a different reason, they wouldn't fly into a rage, which means that reason somehow does play a role in terms of their appetites, right? The problem, though, is the appetite. Because it looks like um, anger will obey reason when the reason is pleasant. But the incontinent person who has anger is more disgraced, he says, because that person always does recognize some portion of reason. So in other words, the person who is incontinent and they get angry a lot, right, because they recognize that they shouldn't do it, we hold them as being morally culpable to a greater de degree. Or in other words, we blame them more, right? And that's going to be an interesting relationship you're going to see in ethical and moral theory is the relationship between blame and the ability to give reasons for things. Now, Socrates gives this sort of interesting example of father-son battery. I guess it's this example he has where I guess there was a, a man who struck his father and then they asked him why he did it. And he said, well, that's because my father struck me when I was younger. Um, I'm sorry, that, that's because my father struck his father, and his father struck his father, and someday my son will strike me. And then he gives the story where the son, later on, was, was striking his father, beating him up, and dragging him across the, the floor or the road or something. And the father says, not any, you must stop, go no further, because my father never beat me any more than this, right? So there seems to be this sort of sense, at least in terms of his example here, that the person who acts out of anger does have some sort of relationship to reason. They have some sort of knowledge, right? Now, ultimately, what does he say? And I think this is the most insightful section on anger, which is the person who acts out of anger acts out of pain. And I don't know about you, but when I think of the times in which I've become angry and acted poorly, or I think of other people, I think there's something truly right about this. I think that people who who act out of anger, somehow they've been pained in some way, okay? So, this let's move on here to section 7, roughly halfway through the book, right? What we can see is that, uh, we can, we can, well, Aristotle says is that we can be easily defeated by any one of these objects, right? So, we he recognized that we're humans and we're frail in this sense, is that we do become angry pretty easily, because we do experience these pains, right? So we can be easily defeated by any one of these objects, whether it's smoking or getting angry, or it's sex or eating too much gourmet food, right? Most people, though, are in the intermediate zone. So most people don't are not defeated by one of these objects. What appears is that most people have one or two of these objects of desire which overtake them. But for most of them, we're, people are not in the extreme. So for instance, you can imagine someone is doing really well in their life, but they, have, they do smoke, and so they've got a smoking problem, right? You can also imagine uh, the people, other people who have, um, well, think, some people are in the very worst condition. Think about the heroin addict, right, who's completely strung out of drugs all the time. That person has been completely defeated, and they're not on the intermediate zone. They're in the far excessive zone in terms of either incontinence or bias or both, right? But most people are in this intermediate zone. So what we can do here is let's now see how we can get a better sense of the relationship to pleasure in incontinence. Now, pleasures can be divided between those which are necessary and those which are unnecessary. So for instance, 
Um, the pleasure of sex is a necessary pleasure if you want to, uh, you know, procreate the species. Uh, I guess it's unnecessary if it's not. But think about this eating. I mean, when you're very thirsty and you drink a cold glass of water, that is such a beautiful pleasure. Um, and that is a necessary pleasure, right? But for instance, getting a brand new iPhone or something like that is an unnecessary pleasure, okay? So self-indulgence can be defined as one who, quote, pursues the excesses of things which are pleasant or pursues to excess necessary objects and does so by choice for their own sake, end quote. And that's from 1149B18 of the Becker uh, pagination. Now, um, you can see here is that it looks like that, now Aristotle then says that it, there is something interesting here is that the person who has no regret is incurable, right? And the self-indulgent person doesn't have regret, whereas the incontinent person does have regret. So the incontinent person is the person who knows they should smoke, but they do it anyway. They regret it, right? But the person who's self-indulgent smokes because they desire the pleasure of smoking for its own sake, right? So it looks like the person who has no regret, the self-indulgent person, is actually worse than the person who's incontinent. When we talk about con incontinence, Aristotle says that we forgive those who are, quote, defeated by violent and excessive pleasures of, or pains, end quote, from 1150b7, right? And there the notion is, notice that we have more uh, sympathy and we're, uh, we're less judgmental on the person who's incontinent, but because they were defeated by violent and excessive pleasures or pains, right? Uh, we don't hold them as accountable. He even says, quote, it is keen and excitable people, ultimately, who, who are quickly, uh, who, who fall into this trap of incontinence, right? They're keen people because keen people are quicker and they're smart to follow things up, and excitable people tend to be more violent, he says. So, keen and excitable people are problematic, I guess. Um, section 8 here, right? Now, what we can see here is, like Aristotle constantly does, you can see it visually with my terrible handwriting, but the way I've tried to write it out here, is he's always comparing two different um, categories or contraries and trying to lay out and deduce the differences between them. So, on the one hand, you have the self-indulgent person. On the other hand, you have the incontinent person. Well, the self-indulgent person doesn't seem to have regret, whereas the incontinent person does have regret. And that means that the self-indulgent person can't be cured because there's no reasons you can give them. There's no knowledge that can be given to the self-indulgent person to change their mind. Whereas the incontinent person can be cured because there is a recognition of reason there. So you can see here is that what this means is that incontinence is not the same thing as vice. And that's because vice um, or virtue, these are matters of choice, right? One has to choose to act in such a way so as to have virtue or a certain vice. Incontinence appears to be a case in which there is no choice, even though there's some sort of reasoning. Um, and you can see here, for Aristotle, reason and choice have to go hand in hand here. Um, so what are some of the points we can take away from this? Well, A, at, quote, excellence and vice respectively preserve and destroy the first principle of action, and in actions that for the sake of which is the first principle as the hypotheses in mathematics. And by the way, this is all one sentence in Aristotle, but I've just broken it into three points because I think it, it's, it's important. The first thing here is what he's saying is that he's recognizing that the person who does act out of either excellence or vice, the person who chooses and can act, they act out of some sort of principle. Now, what you can say is that the principle of your action is the answer to the forsake of which that action is taken. So, for instance, if I get married and the reason I've got get you know, the reason I've become married is because I want to be happy. That is, the sake of my action was to become happy then there you say that happiness is the first principle of my action. In the same way that hypotheses function in mathematics, in particular geometry. Okay, So that's the first sort of thing. Now, well, let's get to the incontinent person. He says, neither in that case is it, the, is it reason that teaches the first principles. So this is interesting because even though reason is totally important for Aristotle, obviously, you can see that he doesn't think that, that reason is what teaches us what sort of things we should act for, right? Reason doesn't teach us these first principles. Well, how are they gained? Well, it says, quote, virtue... Ah, sorry, there's some sort of bug that keeps flying around my face. 
He says, virtue, either natural or produced by habit, habituation, is what teaches right opinion about the first principles. I'm going to put that light on. So it looks like here is that the way in which you gain the right opinions about the first principles is by developing the proper habits, right? Not through reason, not through encyclopedia, not through ethics class, but through habitual activity. That is, so what here you see here is that his view, he's starting to come together here. Because remember, he thinks the incontinent person acts out of these opinions, not out of these right reasons. And it looks like these opinions, all of our opinions, are right opinions are set by our habitual lives, how the habits and activities we, that we inculcate ourselves in. And so it looks like is that maybe this is how we can start to explain the incontinent person. They've had the wrong habits, given them the wrong opinions, potentially, and they're acting out of their opinions rather than the knowledge they have, right? Um, and so, whoops, look, I forgot something there. So, for instance, he gives there, this means that you have this problem of the passionate man. Because the person who's passionate appears to be overcome with passion and therefore becomes incontinent. Uh, and so he's trying to sort of kind of figure all this out. So point, or section number nine, Aristotle divides the continent into two sides. On the one hand, the person who's continent, you could have a person who's continent and they abide by the reason and choice, by their reason and their choices. And they consistently always abide by those, by reason and choice, right? So for instance, I put the example here of Immanuel Kant. And we're going to look at Kant here in a couple of videos. But Immanuel Kant's view is that ultimately, when a person makes a commitment to do the right thing that's reasonable and they choose to do it, they should always consistently do that thing forevermore, right? It's an absolute for Kant. And the other possibility is that, well, maybe continence is about abiding by the right choice. So you can see here is that what he's setting up here is that the continent person chooses but what do they choose based on? Do they choose based upon their previous history of reason and, and the previous choices they've made and they just beat, they just maintain consistency? Or does the person choose based upon the right choices that they recognize they should take? Ultimately, Aristotle is going to say the latter. It's the right choice that we should pursue. We shouldn't just abide by our reason and our choice, right? So he gives a couple examples. One of examples is the strong-headed, right? The person who's strong-headed is someone who's hard to persuade, right? And the strong-headed person seems to be continent in the sense that they abide by reason and choice, right? Because they are, but, but the problem with the person who's strong-headed is it looks like the reason you can't persuade them and the reason they, they're so slow to change their minds is because they have a sort of faithfulness to their passion and a faithfulness to their appetites. Uh, but the problem is that these people tend to be very opinionated. They can be ignorant, and they can also be very boorish. These are sort of, if you will, the types of strong-headed people, the people who don't, who are really opinionated, and that's why they maintain their their sort of consistency, their, of their continent consistency. They're ignorant, they don't know any better, or they're boring and they just don't care, right? Uh, they don't care to change, right? They're boorish, as it were. Now, what you can see here is we can finally begin to distinguish the continent person from the temperate person. The continent person has continent person has bad appetites, right? But they don't act on those bad appetites. Um, whereas it looks like the temperate person has the good appetites. Both are in accordance with reason and not bodily pleasure. So the continent person seems to have bad appetites that they can control, whereas the temperate person appears to have virtue precisely because the intermediate there is that the excellence is that they have the right appetites, uh, and they're not just simply acting based upon pleasure, right? So Aristotle then swings us back in section 10 to think about practical wisdom. And he says practical wisdom, or phronesis, if you'll recall, seems to result from both having knowledge, but more importantly, action. That is, practical wisdom comes from the person who, who learns by doing. And learning by doing is how we cultivate habits or at least that's where our habits come from, is they come from what we do. And if the person who has practical wisdom learns by doing, then ultimately you can see they develop the, the right habits, hopefully. right? So there is a difference here between phronesis and cleverness. We talked about that earlier. Because the clever person is the person who can use reason and figure things out, but they're not practically wise. right? Uh, and so you can say is that cleverness, or with cleverness, you get this question, which is can... The clever person acts incontinently, 
but in a way that is reasonable. And so in other words, it looks like you can have someone who's incontinent, but because they're clever, they do, they act in such a way that seems to be very similar, maybe in its effect, incidentally, with the person who's practically wise. Now, what this means is that he, he says you sort of imagine, right, the person who acts incontinently, but is clever, maybe they do things which are good. And in that case, I don't think we have a problem with it. We can just say they've acted good, even though they were incontinent. It would be an incidental good. But sometimes people act wrongly. They'll act in wickedness, right? And so he says, well, it looks like the person who's incontinent, but clever, is sort of half wicked, because they haven't, they've only halfway chosen to do what they're doing, right? Uh, because incontinence is the inability to act in accordance with your reason, right? So, but they have acted in an intelligent way. So maybe it's a sort of half wickedness. Sounds like a good band name, I think, right? Here's a good quote, quote for you. The incontinent man is like a city which passes all the right decrees and has good laws, but makes no use of them. And then Aristotle quotes Anaxandridus, and he says this quotation, he says, the city wills it that cares not for laws. Right, and so it looks like here is if you had a city that passed laws, but the city didn't care to enforce that laws, you can sort of realize, well, obviously that's not going to be a good city to live in, right? Um, and he thinks that's kind of what the incontinent person is like, right? You could say that there's two types of incontinent people. On the one hand, there's the incontinent people who are excitable; they ju they just act quickly and out of um, excitement and passion. But you also have the incontinent person who's faithless, right? And that way is my term, not Aristotle's. But what Aristotle means there is you have someone who's incontinent, that is, they can't stick to their opinions. Think about the person who's decided to do an exercise routine, but then continually can't keep it up, right? They become incontinent with regard to the fidelity of how they act. They, they can't um, keep their promises, for instance, even to themselves. And so what you can say here is that or what Aristotle says, the person who's excitable and incontinent, this person is more easily cured because this person, as soon as you calm them down, you can sort of reinstate continence. But the person who's, but the person who's faithless with regard to continence, and they can't keep their promises, they can't keep faith, as it were, this person is very difficult to cure. How do you cure incontinence? Well, ultimately, Aristotle's view is habit because it's very difficult to change the nature of a person but what you can do is change their habitual routines. And in fact, I think that's probably the most important part of this book in terms of self-help stuff, if you wanted to say this. Um, or in other words, the most practical part of this whole lesson today is that if you yourself have some problem of incontinence, maybe you're smoking too much, how are you going to change that? Well, it looks like what you have to do is you have to change your habits. So in other words, you have to create a habitual structure that replaces those incontinent behaviors or, or whatnot. And there's lots dug out of this. And by the way, it's never easy to change a habit. Aristotle is fully aware of that. Okay, then we're point 11 here, or section 11. One of the things is Aristotle says, well, okay, let's go back to pleasure. Pleasure is a concern for political science because ultimately it's through pleasure that the political science wants to create incentives for people to act and you want to structure society because pleasure is important, right? But the question is, how important is pleasure um, and to what degree should we um, allow pleasure to function into the ways in which we think to organize the state or society? Well, there seem to be three different views that Aristotle wants to look at with regard to pleasure. One possible view is that pleasure, that no pleasure is good, that pleasure and goodness are really essentially of different kinds. Another view here is that, well, maybe some pleasures are good, but most of the pleasures are bad and you should avoid them. And a third possibility here is that, well, maybe all of the pleasures are good, but the best is not a pleasure. Um, okay, and we're going to see ultimately Aristotle takes this third view. Uh, well, but first off, what are the, if we take this first view, the idea that pleasures are not good, then what are the reasons for thinking that? Well, he actually enumerates them, right? A, one thing here is, one possible reason people think this is because they think that pleasure is a perceptible process to a natural state and that no process is of the same kind as its end. Another possibility is that we recognize that the temperate person avoids pleasure. So the person who has self-control seems to avoid pleasure, and if temperance is a virtue and excellence, 
then it seems that, well, maybe pleasures are not something that are good, something you should pursue. C would be practical wisdom. The person who has phronesis avoids pain, but in their avoiding pain, they're not therefore then going on to pursue things which are pleasurable and pleasant, right? And so you can say is that phronesis avoids pain, but it doesn't pursue pleasure as it were. At least not, it doesn't pursue pleasure as such. D, pleasures seem to hinder reason, right? It looks like that when we're enjoying pleasures, it becomes difficult for us to act reasonably. And he gives the example of sex, right? And he says, when you're absorbed in the sexual act, he says, who can think uh, when that's happening, right? So, and that seems to be true, right? When people are completely, uh, uh, let's put it, absorbed into something which is pleasurable, it becomes very difficult for them to become objective, rational people. And we know this because all of us have experienced this in one way and another with some pleasure or another. E is there is no art of pleasure, right? It doesn't look like there's a way to train people to, uh, to achieve or to attain pleasure, right? It doesn't look like it's a craft, it's an art. So if it's not a craft and it's not an art, then it doesn't look like it's something good because it doesn't look like it's something that's a consequence of reason, right? Um, another example here is this says children and animals seem to have pleasure. <laughs> so if children and animals seem to have pleasure, well, then is it an intellectual good? Doesn't look like it, right? Um, what about the second view? The second view is that not all the pleasures are good, but maybe there's some that are good, but most of them are not, right? What are the reasons for thinking that? Well, two reasons he gives is that some pleasures are base and they're objects of reproach, right? So some people enjoy things which are disgusting and vulgar, right? Um, and so that seems to give us indication that not all the pleasures are good. And then the reason was there seem to be pleasures which are harmful. Take smoking as an example. Uh, that's pleasurable at least for the smoker, but it's harmful to the smoker. And so that seems to be tr proof that pleasures are not always good. And then the final view is that pleasures are not the best. That is, pleasures are good, but they're not the best thing. And here the reason would be is that pleasure is not an end, but it's a process. Um, so how do we take this? Well, why is number view wrong? Well, goodness has two senses, right? Something can be good simply. That is, something is good unequivocally in and of itself. Or something is good in a particular context. So something, if something is good um, in and of itself, then that means there, there must also be, contrary to that, something which is bad without qualification, something which is bad in and of itself. Um, and, on the con and on the contrary side, something, if there's something which is particularly good, then that means there must also be something which is bad in a particular sense. And so for a good example here is to think about medicine that you take, which is painful. Even though it's painful, it creates pleasure down the road. It's still good. And that would be a painful medicine would be something which is a particular good. It's good, but only under particular conditions. It's not good unequivocally. Now, the other thing we should recognize is that something which is good can either be an activity or it can be a state. Or think about this. And I, this is the difference between a verb and a noun, right? You can have things which are good because there are sorts of actions which are good. And you can have states of being, right? momentary time slices, states of affairs, and those states of affairs themselves are what's good, right? Now, pleasure, he says, is not a perceptible process. So this is why he thinks that ultimately this first view is wrong, because what he thinks is that um, pleasure is not a perceptible process, but, quote, it's an activity of the natural state, right? So you can see here is that he wants to use the distinction between activity and state to begin to sort of strip it away and say that Pleasure is not a process of perception, right? It's not that you're perceiving something which is good, right? But it's an activity of a state of being, right? Um, so that means that it's a particular state at a particular moment. And why is one of the things that's here that's interesting to think about is that notice that whenever you have a pleasure, there will always be a time um, and marker to that pleasure such that it ends. In other words, pleasures do not go on forever, right? Pleasures appear to seem to occur and then to um, terminate and then you go into another state of some sort. So his view here is that, uh, that we have a natural state and it's an activity of that natural state, but it's not a process where we're perceiving the good. Uh, so it's not a perception as such. Right? Um, another quote here from 1153a. 
He says, quote, neither practical wisdom or any state is impeded by pleasure arising from it. So what this indicates is that pleasure is a side effect, it's a side activity. That is, we do certain things and pleasures arise from them, but when those pleasures arise, those don't impede our actions, right? A pain seems to impede our actions, but pleasure doesn't seem to impede our actions. Unless, I, I do wonder, what about this problem of sex he gave, right? He says that a person who's absorbed in sex um, can't think. Well, what if someone is being reasonable? Um, I, guess, I guess, could you have the person who has sex for rational reasons? And if they do have sex for rational reasons, when the pleasure arises, does that impede their actions? I guess that's a weird problem I'm thinking of here. Uh, but I think Aristotle would probably not say that's not practical wisdom or something. But anyway, let's move to section 13. So the first thing he sort of seems to suggest is that pleasure is a necessary is is necessarily a good. Why does he think that? Well, pain can you can either have pain which is unqualifiedly bad; it's always bad, and it's a and the opposite of this something which is always good, or you can have pain which is just bad sometimes, right? It's bad but in a qualified sense. Now, but if you have if the opposite of the unqualifiedly bad is that which is unqualifiedly good or good without qualification, then that must mean that some pleasures are necessarily good. Now, notice here that most of the pleasures probably are not of this type, but it does mean that pleasure, at some level, is necessarily good for Aristotle, because you can have pain, which is always bad under all conditions. Now, the pleasure of knowledge is an interesting thing here, because he seems to suggest that, for instance, when you gain knowledge, you gain pleasure, but unlike the other sites of pain, knowledge doesn't appear to have a vice, right? There doesn't seem to be pain that results from knowledge, right? Uh, there doesn't seem to be pain which results from knowledge. So knowledge is one of these interesting and important pleasures. Uh, now, next he goes on, he says, that if the most desirable thing is good and it, and it produces pleasure, well, then that pleasure will be good. So you can see here is that Aristotle doesn't deny pleasure. He thinks that pleasure is an important element and an important part of what it means to live a good life, but pleasure is not the end-all pursuit, right? He says that pleasure is a chief good, but wisdom seeks the end, not the pleasure for the end. So in other words, pleasure, some pleasures which are, are um, good without qualification, necessarily good, we should pursue them, but the person who has wisdom doesn't, doesn't seek the pleasure they seek a, the end towards which their action is, and pleasure arises as a side effect. And that pleasure is good, right? So you can see here, he wants to sort of have his cake and eat it too. In other words, he's not a hedonist. He doesn't think that pleasure is the sole reason for action. But he does think that there are pleasures which are really good, and we shouldn't deny that, right? So like in all of his philosophy, Aristotle tends to take this middle ground. So he says, quote, the life of the good man will not be pleasanter than that of anyone else if his activities are not more pleasant. That is, in other words, since pleasure is simply a side effect of action, as it were, and it's a state and activities or a state of disposition, right? Then that means that if you live a good life, um, it's not going to be any more pleasurable than anyone else's life, unless you're doing something that's more pleasant, right? Because it's not the goodness of something that gives you the pleasure, right? So that, that means that you, should that you should pursue what is good and you should gain pleasure, but you should pursue pleasure simply because you want to experience it. Okay, section 14. Now, why do the body, bodily pleasures, quote, appear more worthy of choice? Now, think about it. Just pause for a moment. Uh, you're watching this video lecture, so obviously, hopefully, you like philosophy. But think about it for a moment. There is a pleasure of philosophy, but if you have to choose two things, right? If you have to choose between reading a philosophy book, right, reading Aristotle, or um, having wonderful, amazing sex, right, most people will always consistently choose the sex, not the philosophy, right? Now, obviously, maybe you don't you choose the philosophy, hopefully, right? But the question here is, it just appears when we look at life that we tend to choose bodily pleasures. Why? Well, number one, to expel pain, right? We try to get rid of our pains. 
and we get those by gaining pleasure. Um, number two is maybe we can't enjoy other pleasures. So maybe, for instance, that a person doesn't know how to read, and so they can't enjoy the philosophy pleasure, so they pursue these other bodily pleasures instead. He even suggests that it looks like we have a tendency as humans to manufacture our own thirst. So it looks like that, that maybe we can't enjoy other pleasures, and so we create new pleasures to enjoy, right? Because when we can't enjoy those, we create something else to take its place. So maybe that's one of the reasons we pursue these bodily pleasures. But I like that name, Manufacturing Thirst. Again, that would be a cool band name, I think. Um, another possibility is maturation. Uh, that is the youth. He notices, he just remarks, and we all have experienced this, and maybe for some of you, you're experiencing this now, is that as we develop uh, and as we mature and our bodies develop in our youth, we have, because of our hormones, we have, he says, violent desires. And, and, you, and we also have more greater amounts of pain when we're growing. And think here about the sort of depression that kids experience and how that can be so much more devastating than the other sorts of depression that other people have. I don't know about depression, but it seems like that in youth, we tend to uh, pursue more bodily pleasures. And part of that is just because of what it means to be human, right? And he does say, by the way, is that pleasures without pains have no excess, right? So if you can have a pleasure, but that pleasure cannot in principle involve a pain at all, um, then that means that there can be no excess to that pleasure, right? So pursuing that pleasure is something which is always good, then, right? Um, so another thing here is that no thing is always pleasant, right? So that means he says that, he remarks that there's no object of desire which is always going to be pleasurable for us as humans. Um, he says, he really, this is my phrasing, but he talks about the ideas. The reason that this is the case is because human beings are always changing, right? And since we're always changing, that means we're very complex. And you might call this as the complex business of being human, right? And he actually says here, it's sort of an interesting remark here. And here there's a reference to the metaphysics in his discussion of the unmoved mover. If you're interested, take a, take a watch my video on the unmoved mover in my metaphysics series um, on Aristotle. But he says, for instance, that God enjoys a simple, singular pleasure. Because for him, God doesn't change. And since God doesn't change, God is not composed of a substance that can change. And so God is a simple substance, if you will. And if God is a simple substance then God's pleasure is singular and simple as well, right? Um, whereas by contrast, since human beings are constantly changing and we are composed of, thing, of things which are changing, it means that for us, our pleasures are also in a sort of turbulent roller coaster ride. This is the complex business of being human, which is namely that nothing is always going to be pleasurable for us. So that means, for instance, is that we all know this, is that um, when you're kids, and for instance, you have a celebration, you open a lot of gifts, maybe at Christmas time or, or Hanukkah or some other um, festival event, you get a lot of gifts. What we notice is that when you, the first gift you're excited about opening and playing with as a child, um, that's the first gift you will forget and not care about in the future, right? In other words, things wear out. And because things wear out, this may be one of the reasons we start manufacturing our own thirst, as Aristotle puts it. So this sort of gives you a sense of the Aristotelian pleasures. And well, you know what? This concludes Aristotle's discussion on incontinence and pleasure um, from Book 7 of the Nicomachean Ethics. Um, watch our next video, which will be on Book 8. And Book 8 is on the problem or the topic of friendship. Okay, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for being patient with my terrible handwriting and my notes. But I hope this video has been instructive and helpful. Okay, I'll see you guys online. Bye.